All right. Good morning, everyone, um, and and welcome to our education series. As you anticipated and registered, we're we're going to highlight mentorship. It's an absolute honor um, to have an incredible panel willing um, to join us today to certainly share their wisdom on mentorship, uh, what it means to be a mentor, some best practices, and what really the hope is for all of us to maybe take a couple of these nuggets away as we anticipate the start of our season and look into our staff or our professional relationships with our peers and be a little bit introspective on how we mentor others. And, uh, you know, hopefully, again, hopefully take some takeaways from today. Um, I just wanted to start and say uh, a really uh, quick thank you, frankly, to the Met PGA Board Education Committee and Employment Committee. Um, a little bit of context here, how we landed on, you know, really a mentorship seminar. We, we, we talk a lot about mentorship, but in, in the past, there really wasn't anything really structured. So um, there was the idea to have a structured mentorship program within the MEP PGA. Uh, and right around December um, and right around the, the PGA show, the MEP PGA launched a structured mentorship initiative. And, and really what that entailed was if you were registered for deferred compensation, uh, you were automatically enrolled unless you had a commitment and would let um, and would let us know that you, know, you couldn't fulfill that obligation. And then as a mentor, you were paired uh, with a mentee and uh, and everyone was included. So certainly if you're a head golf professional, you probably would anticipate, you know, mentoring a fellow head professional or an assistant. And then if you're an assistant, you would be mentoring likely another assistant or an associate and help them with their path towards membership. The feedback has been absolutely incredible. So for those that are on the call that are participating, you know, a, a sincere thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to share uh, very briefly here, the mentorship playbook. So even if you're not enrolled in the, the mentorship um, program for this year, uh, we, we certainly have a, a guideline on, you know, what it means to mentor, uh, and apologies for starting from the bottom here, but I'll, I'll start from the top, um, you know, a little bit of the program overview, but there are little nuggets in this guide that you certainly can, can take away concerning best practices, you know, the phases of mentorship and, and how you can walk through that with, you know, with your team or someone that you're mentoring um, and then go through the, a, goal, a goal setting process. So um, please, please know that we, we certainly do have uh, resources uh, for you um, in, in case you in case you need them. Um, with that said, uh, you know, certainly when I, I think of mentorship and and we look at the history of mentorship, we don't have to go far to to understand certainly in our profession um, you know, the, the, those that are incredible mentors and, and one, and obviously the, 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 one that comes to a lot of our minds is, is, is coach Bill Strasbaugh. And <clears throat> I, I kind of like looked into, to, to coach Strasbaugh a little bit. I never had the same pleasure of, of meeting him or interacting with him. Um, but try to gain an understanding of, you know, what, what made coach such a wonderful mentor. And, you know, he often would say that it's really just effort. Right, it's it, and and the Estrada Award, and, and if you ask him about it, um, when when he was here, he would say it's an effort award, and it's really just going a little bit above and beyond to make that positive difference in someone else's life, and investing your time in them to get them to where they want to go, right? And that's the kind of the big takeaways from Coach. Um, but with that being said, um, I'm going to step back into a moderator role and and introduce our our wonderful panel today. Um, you know, joining us to talk a little bit about mentorship, um, you know, how they go about it, who has influenced them in their lives. Uh, we have Bree Howie uh, from the Pipe and Rock Club, Jim Bender from Ardsley, Agent Sekula from Sleepy Hollow, Brendan Walsh from the Country Club, and joining us shortly uh, will be Sam Wiley from Weburn. Um, so team, thank you again for joining us today. I'm going to give a little bit of a softball question just to get everyone kind of peek behind the curtain here. Um, so... Jim, I'm going to start with you first and kind of pass it down the line. Same question. Um, how did you get introduced to the game one? And then, you know, who are some of your mentors? Thank you, John. Um, well, I was introduced to the game back when I was 12 years old, a um, place called Echo Lake Country Club, which everyone's probably heard of down in New Jersey. And uh, started, um, you know, going to the clinics, the junior clinics, and uh, assistant pros would be teaching me. I eventually started working at the range and asked the pro if I could, um, you know, um, kind of pick the range, but at the same time hit balls whenever I wanted. 
And I was out there, you know, right next to the assistant pros, watching them teach and things like that. Um, as it, I got older, I met a guy named, as when I was 17, I met a guy named Russell Helwig, who was the head pro at, um, well, at the time he was the assistant pro at Echo Lake and uh, became the head pro at um, Essex Fells Country Club. And uh, I kind of told him what I, I was looking to do after college. Um, and I ended up going to Rutgers and I was pretty close by so I could go up and see him a lot. Um, and he helped me with my game. And at the same time, he uh, asked me to come to work for him um, when I turned uh, when I when I graduated from college. And uh, I worked for him for three years. Uh, he was totally my mentor. He, uh, you know, I looked up to him so much because um, he kind of knew how how to do it. Um, he knew how to run a great golf shop. He knew how to teach. He, he was a really good player uh, in the section. And uh so I, I kind of followed uh, everything he did and watched everything he did and literally copied everything he did, I think, uh, um, you know, because I, I knew that he was very successful at, at what he did at the club. Uh, and, um, you know, again, he was um, a board member in the PGA. Um, he did a lot of things that uh, you kind of aspire to become, even though you might not get there if you try to aspire to become it, your goals, you might get most of your goals done if you can try to do that and i think that that's that's kind of what i did and um and and he was really a a big part of my life and uh i moved on after after three years i got my pga card and got the head pro job at ardsley and that was 1982 and i've been there since awesome thanks jim brennan good morning first of all thank you all for having me uh treat to be back in uh be associated with the Met section. A lot of great memories there when my time at the Patterson Club. And I was telling Jim earlier before folks got on, and Jim was the president of the PGA back in the day when I was uh, on the board with the Met PGA. And we had a lot of fun. He took me to my first annual meeting and showed me the ropes. So it's great to see you're still at it, Jim. You've been a mentor for a lot of folks along the way. So congrats on your incredible career. Thanks, I've been friend. blessed. Uh, I, my greatest mentor is my father. Uh, he introduced us to the game of golf. I grew up in a large family just outside of Philadelphia. I had a chance to play a lot of golf. Uh, we grew up at the Philadelphia Country Club and and then getting into the golf business. My college golf coach, Bob Nye, was a PJ professional. Now, you may know his sons, Gary and Scott and Greg. And Scott and I are uh, very close today. And, and then getting out of school, uh, first head professional I worked for, a guy by the name of Jim Fitzgerald, had a great career at the Chevy Chase Club. And he was an incredible mentor, taught me how to be a professional. And then he turned me to a fellow by the name of Bill Adams. I went to the Ridgewood Country Club for five years. And Bill was an incredible mentor and taught me how to uh, communicate with people, how to delegate. And uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, he helped me uh, get a, the job at the Patterson Club in Fairfield, Connecticut. And and I uh, had a great seven years there. And Along the way, uh, the mentors, uh, Bob Nye, who's our golf coach in college, uh, as I mentioned, uh, helped along the way. And then when I got to the country club, a guy by the name of David Shag, uh, incredible individual, our general manager for a long time, just recently retired. Uh, he's been a great mentor along the way. And, you know, so many people touch your lives and you get little nuggets here or there and you meet people that are just uh, become very important in your life as well. And so... Uh, I'm always thankful and grateful each and every day for all the people that have helped me uh, because we can't do this by ourselves. We need people to help us. And uh, as I tell everybody, don't be afraid to ask for help because uh, people want to help you. Uh, we all want to do nice things for people. So don't be afraid to reach out. I always encourage people to go and, and call people for lunch or have a cup of coffee and spend some time with them because uh, you never know where it's going to take the relationship. Thanks, Brennan. We'll go AJ and then Reed. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, honored to be on this panel. Thank you for the invite. Uh, gosh, uh, I really just to piggyback a little bit of, of what Brendan said there, I think it's been amazing. So I, I got into golf late, and so I, I went to didn't play any golf growing up. I went to uh, school on a baseball scholarship, got into golf at age 25. I uh, started up at Proud Snack up in Maine, loved it up there, and I, I kind of took the initiative a couple times and reached out to some well-known PGA professionals who had uh, some storied careers, and what Brennan just said, that people are so willing to help. Uh, I, I picked up the phone and reached out to, gosh, I did a trip in Philadelphia to some of those clubs, to Atlanta, to Chicago, and I was just trying to pick their brains about their 
their experiences in the golf industry and kind of how they got to where they were. And, and everyone was just so overly accommodating uh, and so generous with their time and, um, and mentoring. So gosh, it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it, it's been amazing working for, for Brendan. I was fortunate to work on Brendan's staff back in 2014. I was, I still think to this day, I'm one of the shortest tenured assistant professionals you've ever had, Brendan. And, and Brendan, I've told a lot of people, I, Brendan has inspired me more than anybody in my entire life, just seeing the amount of, of effort and time and energy that he puts into the development of, of other people. Uh, very inspirational. I was fortunate to work for Bob Ford down at Seminole and uh, another storied mentor in our industry and and just watching Bob go about his day to day. Uh, but probably one of my biggest takeaways from being around uh, Bob was was just how how he carried himself and how how he has handled success. Uh, there's probably no one who has received more accolades than he has in our profession. And to see how humble and kind uh, and generous he is with with everybody. Uh, was was incredible to see. Um, I, I have to mention J.J. Weaver. He's been a, a great mentor to me. Longtime co-head professional at Augusta National. Hired me at Inverness. So J.J. spends the summers up at Inverness as the director of golf. He hired me as the head professional. That's where I was before Sleepy Hollow for three and a half years. And, and J.J., I, I thought that I was a good PGA professional until I met J.J. Weaver. He brought... He brought a, a level of intensity and a level of uh, excellence that I had not seen before. And, and he's, he's intense and uh, I, I respect the, the heck out of that man. And, and just his, his level of preparedness that he goes into everything was uh, life-changing for me. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, I, I, kind of echo what Brendan said. I mean, my, my first mentors in my life were, were family members. So my, my father is still one of the biggest mentors and from a personal side and my, my two grandparents, um, my, my, uh, mom's dad is the one that ended up getting me into the game early. Um, he had me out hitting balls with plastic clubs when I was about four years old and taking me to the driving range and some of my kind of earliest memories. And, uh, he was my, pretty much my only teacher until he passed away in 2011. Um, and that was kind of right, right as I was really starting to get into golf and and looking at golf as a, as a future for me. Um, uh, and then ended up, ended up pursuing a PGM program at Florida state, um, was lucky enough to be surrounded by some awesome individuals there. Um, notably, a, a Matt Cahill down at Seminole had lived and kind of worked side by side with him on a daily basis. So, great to kind of draft off him and, and see, see him kind of live it, uh, every day in college. Um, uh, that kind of helped lead into my post-grad career. I had, had some great internships, um, kind of early mentor on the professional side was, uh, Andrew Shuck at Charlotte country club was there for his first year in 2012. Um, and then in 2014 after school, I went to work for, for Bob Ford as well as Oak, at Oakmont. Um, and, and that kind of gave me sort of the springboard to be able to, to, uh, work for Bob year round, uh, did Oakmont and Seminole for, for five years straight, um, started as an intern and working outside at, uh, at Seminole and, uh, and an intern as Oakmont and kind of left running, running the business five years later. So, um, kind of a fast elevation and, and kind of a drastic change in responsibilities and, and, and kind of what I had to do on a daily basis. But, um, as AJ said, just watching how Bob conducts himself on a daily basis, how he treats every single individual he interacts with, how he how he makes you feel like his best friend and and is so caring and 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 takes the time for every person that walks through that door or or comes up um, uh, comes up to to say hi or or spend a few minutes with him was was something that I'll never forget. Um, also, have to mention Devin at Oakmont, Devin Gee. Um, outstanding individual has been like a big brother to me, uh, for many years. Uh, same thing as, as Bob, just watching how he conducts himself around the membership, how he, how he's so thoughtful, um, about everything that he does and, and really takes the time to make the right decision. Um, even, even if it's not the easiest one, um, in, in a lot of cases, um, and really just, just puts the time and the effort into making sure that every little thing is done to the best that it possibly can be done. Um, 
another influence on my life was was Brian Peeper at Lost Tree. Um, he's he's um, treated me like family. Worked one season down there between school and Oakmont. Um, was a kind of in, my introduction to sort of a big family club atmosphere, um, and and also to kind of the sort of the seasonal golf golf world in a lot of ways. Um, and I took took a lot of what I've learned learned there in just five months from Brian uh, to to what I'm doing now here at Piping Rock. Um, so, yeah, very very fortunate to where be a, have been where I've been um, and to be where I am now. And I owe it all to those individuals I mentioned, and and most importantly, kind of the back to my childhood and and the family that um, kind of raised me the right way and and took the time to invest in me. Um, and all, all I'm trying to do is kind of represent all those individuals as best I can on a daily basis. Yeah, it's fantastic, Reed. Reed, I'm going to stay with you a little bit, right? So um, kind of going through what you mentioned before and what everyone mentioned um, a little bit, and, you know, as to Brandon's point, mentioned like little nuggets, right? So if you had a single out, and it's really tough to do, and I can totally get that, but um, what is, in your opinion, like the best advice you've ever received from from your mentor? And, and certainly would love to hear everyone's feedback as well. Um, so I think I think there's a couple. I think one's broad and I'll, I'll one was one is more focused. Um, the single best piece of advice I ever got from a professional standpoint was from Andrew Shuckwaz at Charlotte. Um, at the time, I was kind of contemplating um seeing different parts of the golf industry. Um, I, I really had an interest in equipment and was thinking about going into uh, more of the hard goods side of things um, and kind of being a tech rep, something like that. Um, I thought it was fascinating. Um, and he basically told me, look, like you can go anywhere you want to go from high end private from where you are right now. Um, you can't always come back and get back in if you if you decide to go that a different route. Um, and I think that single decision is what kind of is where the light bulb went on to, in my head um, of, hey, I need to be on the head professional route. I need, need to be stay on the route that I'm on now um, because I can always go do whatever I want from that route. Um, and I think that that in itself was kind of the most defining um, defining decision I probably made in from a career standpoint and really started the process of how I how I worked on a daily basis. Um, I would say the second piece is just from Bob is um, is just treat people with respect. I think that's kind of the most important thing you can do on a daily basis um, is just respect people's time by being on, on time um, respects people's thoughts. So you got to listen um, and, and be thoughtful and don't be dismissive. I mean, I think it's, I think that's, if you can sim sim simply respect people on a daily basis and re give respect to everybody that surround you surround yourself with, I think you're going to do pretty well. Well said. Thanks, Reed. AJ, how about you? Best advice you've ever received from a mentor? Yeah, like, like one that comes to mind is is really just trying. I, I feel like I have a very collaborative approach to to kind of building our team and and just asking people for their opinions. Uh, sitting down with individuals, I heard one of the uh, biggest compliments that you could give another person is to ask for their opinion. So I, I spend a lot of time with with my staff one on one and in group settings and our staff meetings and and asking other people what. Uh, what they think, how, how's the, how's the season going? How's the operation? What's the membership saying? What are areas that we can improve and, um, and allowing our staff to be part of the solutions and, and to really kind of buy into a lot of, of the decisions uh, that we make as a team. Uh, another one that I like to talk a lot about with the staff, uh, this was a man named Bill Green. He was a, a East Tennessee boy member at a, at a bunch of some fine clubs around the country. Uh, I was going on a, a little golf trip with him and I was the, the brand new head professional at grandfather. This was eight or nine, 10 years ago. Uh, and, and I asked him for some advice and he said the best advice that he had ever received in his career is to find the right people on your bus and, and to make sure that the people on your bus are sitting in, in the right seats that accentuate their strengths. And if anybody's on your bus, that that's, detrimental to your culture, to your vision, and is, uh, is it good for, for team culture and environment, then they need to get off your bus. Uh, so that's uh, certainly something that I've taken to heart. Thanks, AJ. We go Jim and then, then Brendan. Jim, how about you? 
Well, I think that, um, as I said, Russ was my mentor and um, he used to say, um, try to run your golf operation and everything you do. Like if you were the member, how would you want it run? So, you know, my members, you know, are looking at it. They want to come up here and enjoy the club, enjoy their round of golf, enjoy their lessons, um, their practice time. And, and how would that be presented? If you were a member, how would you want that presented? And if I can say to myself, this member would want it this way and do that and have my staff uh, be involved that way. I think that, that kind of was the best advice that I've ever gotten. Um, you know, Russ, you know, his, his golf shop was really good. It was perfect. He had the the merchandise that um, the members wanted. Um, in fact, at Essex Fells, we didn't have a driving range at the time. So we had to teach off the, um, you know, first hole after 10 o'clock and uh, on the 18th hole before 10 o'clock. So, but he made sure that, you know, he still ran it like uh, really good golf balls and things like that so that they, they could hit it. He presented that to them um, properly. Um, you have to have a good game of golf. And, and back in the day, you know, I, I was a much better player than I am now. But, um, you know, I would go out with the members. He'd have me play with the members. Um, he would play with the members. And, and they, they were looking to have the pro be out there and play with the membership and the assistants to be out there with the membership. And then, of course, running tournaments at the highest level, um, making sure, you know, everything was done ahead of time. So when the members showed up, it was it just looked like everything was flowing properly with the tournament. So, you know, he he was saying to me that um, if you're if you're driving to the club as a member and you walk into that front door, how do you want your day to be? It, it needs to be smooth and perfect. And 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 that's the advice that he gave me. And I, I took it to heart. Awesome, Jim. Thanks for sharing. It reminds me of like the difference between gold level service, which is treat others how you want to be treated, but platinum service to your point is treat others how they want to be treated, right? So well, right. well taken. Brendan, how about you? Best advice oh, you great received? feedback. You know, we've got so much advice in our time and, you know, I look back and, uh, you know, it's the golden rule is treat people the way you want to be treated. And, you know, as somebody said to me, and it's not that hard to be nice, and you just think about uh, people want to see a smile every day. You want to feel, make them feel safe and comfortable. And that advice I got early in my career from Bill Adams, just make people feel comfortable. And it goes a long way. Um, I, I got a piece of advice that I, he was a friend. And just as you're in the business longer, and Jim and myself have been in a lot longer than uh, the other folks on the panel. But, you know, it's when you're at a place for a long time, it's you've seen a lot and every new committee people, committee persons that come on board, they all want to bring ideas. And we've seen these ideas over and over. And we know the ones that work, the ones that don't work. But this advice I got, and it's really helped me in the last 15 years of my career is this person had lost their job. And they said to me, I said, can you give me some guidance? You know, you've been at a club a long time. I'm at a club a long time. And he says, Brendan, you know, I, I stopped listening to what they wanted. I was trying to tell them what they wanted to hear and it caught up with them because the members wanted to see, try new things. And this person wasn't open to that. And so as I get a lot and now, uh, as we start to get younger people on committees that I'm listening to what they want more than me trying to tell them what I think that they need. And sometimes it takes a year or two to go ahead and try it out, make them feel good. And they realize it doesn't work. And so it's uh, being more open-minded as I age and it's really helped me and it's been a great reminder for me to make sure that it is their club. And it's very important that uh, we're listening to what they want versus what we think that they need. So it's been a, a great thing that I've used and it's helped a tremendous amount. Brennan, thanks for sharing. I'm, I'm gonna stay with you for a second here um, and get into you know your approach and now how you've taken all these lessons and pretty much crafted your own mentorship style to, men to mentor someone else. Um, and, and certainly a lot of wonderful assistant professionals. Um, and then also a lot of people that may have, you know, exited the game at the, at the same point. But with that being said, Brennan, you know, what is your approach to mentorship and, and certainly some of the, the fundamentals or the foundation that you believe in when mentoring someone else? You know, somebody say, why do you mentor? And I come back and say, why not? You know, we're in this business to help people get better. And you know, if you, if they'll pay it forward. I've had so many people that have helped me and, and helped me get better and give me opportunities. And you have to have a lot of patience along the way because there's going to be a lot of hiccups along the way. But uh, your goal each and every day is to get everybody around you to 
make sure they're getting the most of each and every day. We have a saying here, 1% better every day and, and making sure that we're getting the most and making the most of your time, being efficient, work smarter, not harder type of thing and making sure that we're doing that. And I just, um, I've been blessed to have great people and I've just decided to, you know, as I became a head professional, my goal was to try to help people. And it's, it's not that hard to do. And you, know, you just need to put the time you need to be organized. And I get sad when I get phone calls from folks around the country and, and they're not getting that help from their head professionals and what have you. And I just have, uh, it just, that's my mission each and every day. Obviously you want to take care of our members, but um, you know, a family's number one and I'm probably staff is two and memberships three and making sure that we are doing everything we can for our staff to help them. Because if you're taking the staff, uh, they're going to take care of the members and, so if you take care of the people that are with you, there's an expression we use, you're only as good as the team and the team is only as good as it communicates. And we need to make sure that everybody around us, we're doing everything we can to give them everything you have, because then they're going to take care of the membership. And it's, uh, you need good people. You're only as good as the people around you. Uh, I don't, everybody's good on this call, but we're nothing without the people around us. And we need that team around us because it can't be everywhere. So it's very, very important that we don't ever forget that. Don't let your ego, we always use the expressions, check your ego in at the door. There's no disease of me. It's uh, everything's we. And I always correct people in the shop when they, memory will come in looking for something. And the person says, I don't have that for you, Mr. So-and-so. And I'll come back in and say, there's nothing about I in this. It's we don't have that for you. And we'll do everything we can to try to get it for you versus the I. Awesome. Jim, how about you? You know, with what Brendan just said also is that if your staff knows that you have their back and you're looking out for them for the future, like what what do they want? Uh, what are your goals? What Where do you want to go after this? Um, after you work for me for a few years, do you want to become a head golf professional? Um, do you want to become a director of instruction? Um, and and that's kind of if, if they see that you're caring about that, they're going to look out for your back and uh, and give it back to you uh, a lot. And so you know, the mentee, you know, is going to have to ask you questions about, you know, what did you do, let's say, or what are other people doing in the business that's going to help me get to my next level, let's say. Um, do I want to be a head pro? And if I do, um, how am I going to get there? What are the steps to get there? And you're going to have to mentor them to get to those steps. And then they know that um, you're helping them out and they're going to have your back when they're working for you. Nice. Thanks, Jim. Reed, what about you? Um, just to echo kind of off of off of what Jim said, I mean, I think it's so important to start with the end in mind. Um, I think we're all fortunate to have great people around us, like Brendan said, and and our job is to put them in positions they can be they're going to be successful, but also positions that are going to allow them to get to where they want to go. Um, and so I do a lot of work with with our guys here and anybody that I any kind of young assistants that I'm working with uh, or PGM students or any, anybody like that to sort of kind of define where you want to go, define the role you want to have, and then develop a strategy to get there. Um, if you can get, I, I, I've taken on a lot of, or I, I, I like taking on a lot of first year interns here at Piping because we can take three months um, and we can kind of get them in and get them indoctrinated in the program quickly. Um, but also we can help them, I like helping them strategize what the next three years look like in college and how to end up right out of college where they're going to have an opportunity to to learn from someone great um, that's just going to serve as a springboard into their their job long term. Um, because those those early years kind of in your 20s, 20s and 30s, when you have a little bit more flexibility is are, are years that it, if you take advantage of them, really the sky's the limit. Um, it comes down to if you strategize correctly. It's just about showing up every day, being the best self, uh, best version of yourself you can be um, and and working really working as hard as you can um, and the rest will kind of take care of itself. So I, I really believe in working, working with the end in mind, developing a strategy of how to get there and then um, helping make connections that are that are going to get the individual to where they want to go. Thanks, Reed. AJ. Wow. That's some great stuff. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I love talking about the the end in mind read too. Yeah, it, as soon as you know where somebody wants to go, then yeah, we try to be very intentional 
in, in everything that we're doing each and every day. Uh, yeah, what, whether that's you're taking on new responsibilities, you're exposing yourself to different parts of the operation, uh, how you're spending your free time. Are you going out there and trying to observe different instructors on your days off? Are you trying to uh, go out and build your network? Uh, yeah, where do you go from here? Uh, well, yeah, well, what's the end goal and what are the two, three, four, five steps? Uh, how, how do you streamline your career to to get to where you want to be? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's very strategic uh, and intentional for sure. I like I want to piggyback off of something Brennan said because it's something that that I love to talk about is is we look after one another first uh, before the membership. I I could wholeheartedly agree that if if we as head professionals, if, if we're looking after our assistants and the assistants are looking after the interns and the interns are looking after the outside staff, the outside staff's looking after uh, the assistants. If everyone's looking after one another and we're all setting ourselves up for success, if we're all helping one another succeed in our individual roles and daily tasks, then the membership is going to have an awesome experience. Um, so I, I, I love that focus. I think sometimes there can be too much focus uh, on the membership. And, and we don't always treat each other with respect. And, and when, a, when someone on our team asks one of us for help, I expect our staff to same with that, to answer and to respond with that same level of enthusiasm and eagerness to help uh, as if our club president walked in and asked for help too. Um, so yeah, we, we talked a lot about that. AJ, I, I kind of want to stay here for a little bit, right? So um you know, head professional, new new club, new team, right? And you're, you're kind of tying into culture into that as well. So um, it sounds like that is, you know, your, your version of like a great team culture. Um, and I'm curious what everyone else's opinion is of like, you know, what does great team culture mean to you? And also like, how do you set those expectations? How are you going about setting those expectations so everyone on the team um, understands what what that culture should be? Great question. Probably one of my favorite topics. Uh, I think culture certainly starts with the the hiring process. Uh, during the hiring process, I, I mean, I, I love the saying of "slow to hire, quick to fire." Uh, I think you have to put people through the ringer. You have to make sure that they know exactly what is coming their way. Uh, if there's only one thing that Brendan Walsh ever taught me up at the country club, it is to clearly define expectations for the staff, and and so. In the interview process, uh, I tend to try to drag that out almost as much as possible and, and have them go through three, four different interviews. And I'll send them the, our policies and procedures manual and say, you know, this we, we are very intentional. We're very structured here. Uh, there's probably a lot more feedback, and that's not for everybody. Uh, so think about whether or not that's the kind of environment that you feel like you could thrive in. Uh, so it certainly starts with, with the the interview process. And then there's, uh, we do a lot of staff meetings. Uh, we do a lot of one-on-ones with everybody to check in, see how they're doing. Uh, I think a big part of setting culture is simply to talk about culture. Um, again, we talk about looking after one another, but but I think probably the, the, the most important part of culture is, is having people on our team that enjoy coming into work. I think that's such a huge part of the hospitality industry. And, and I think sometimes we lose focus on we're in the recreation industry. People, our members are here to recreate most of the time. I mean, obviously they're bringing some clients out and, and you have to have a good balance of being professional. Um, but people want to have fun. People want to come to the club and smile and laugh and cut it up a little bit and, and have a great time. And so I, I think a huge part of, of our culture is we have fun doing what we do. Brendan, does that sound familiar? I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> yes. You know, it's uh, thanks, AJ, for your kind words. And, you know, it's as I stress to people, this defining of expectations, people don't take enough time. I met with a local hip professional yesterday and he just was kind of curious about how to define expectations. It takes time. And the time you, that you invest early in defining expectations is going to help, only going to help you through the season. And AJ mentioned during the hiring process, it's really important that they understand what they're getting into and that they're going to get feedback. And I always preface the feedback that you can take the feedback two ways. You can be defensive 
and now it's going to go ahead and you're going to feel sorry for yourself and be mad at the person giving you the feedback. Or you can appreciate that the people on your team, including myself, have taken the time and they're going to go ahead and tell you what that feedback is to help you get better. And if you preface it that, hey, you're going to give feedback, but you let them know it's only to help them and that if we're not giving you feedback, we're doing you a disservice. And I always uh, remind the younger people, if you're not getting feedback, you ought to be careful because you're probably not going to be sticking around either. And as, as you're defining expectations, you are hiring, firing at the same time, because if there's problems with the team and people aren't buying in, then it's not going to be a surprise after you talk to them two or three times as they go forward. And then the last thing I'll leave you with with culture is if you look up the definition of culture in the dictionary, it's shared beliefs. And you think about leaders, leadership defines culture and then culture defines behavior. A lot of leaders chase behavior before they change the culture. So as a leader, you need to go ahead and change that culture. And how do you change it is by defining those expectations, but living those expectations every day. And you have to make sure you make people accountable for those expectations as you go. It's the only way you're going to be able to change it. But as a leader, you can't chase behavior. You can change behavior for a couple of days. But until you change that culture, you're never going to change the behavior for the full duration. So just remind yourselves that if you don't have the right culture, you as the leader need to look yourself in the mirror and change that culture and making sure that you're going through that. But the definition is shared beliefs. And you can have bad culture and you can have good culture. But if you have good culture, people are going to line up and they want to work for you. Thanks, Brennan. Um, hey, Sam, I just saw Sam Wiley join us. Thanks for joining us. Can you hear me loud and clear? Sam, you may be on mute. Sam, if you can hear me, I think your microphone is on mute. Yeah, can you hear me now, Jonathan? And everybody? Loud, and, loud and clear. Good morning. My apologies for the delay. I was just a department head meeting, so I need to catch up on some things. So thanks again. Yeah, I totally understand. Thanks for joining us. Sam, I'm gonna throw you right in the fire right while we can. Um, the okay. question that we threw around the panel um, right now we're, we're, we're talking about is uh, your team and specifically the culture of the team. You know, what is, Sam, for you, like what is great culture for your for your team at Weaver? And then also like, how do you go about establishing that culture? Well, I mean, I think culture is everything. I think it's um, you know, something that I take great pride in kind of the culture that we've created here. It's it's certainly uh, shared values and belief, and it's kind of exhibited in, in how we behave on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, I always think about how I want to be treated in any given kind of situation. And certainly I want to treat my staff and my membership kind of in that same manner. Thanks, Sam. Um, we'll go Jim and then, and then Reed. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, this year, I have um, four new uh, assistant pros. Um, um, it's 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 different to have all four, and therefore, I'm now getting back into being a little bit more involved in every bit of it. There, where I used to have an assistant pro. Um, excuse me. Sorry, I know. I'm off the screen. Hold on one second. Well, you, can you still hear me? Hear me? Loud and clear, Jim. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so I have four new assistant pros, and um, I, you know, I hired him. One was an intern that was here two years ago, so he knows a little bit about the culture of of, of here at the club, um, and and how I like to do things, and at the same time. Um, I need to teach all the new ones exactly what it is around the around the shop and things like that, as well as, you know, the teaching end of it, um, what the members like, what they don't like. And uh, and that's been, you know, it's starting, you know, two weeks ago. It's all coming together. But uh, I try to explain to them on everything I do, why I'm doing it, what, what's the reasoning behind it. And I think that's been mm -hmm. Um, really important. Um, and then they understand it a little bit more. And then I also ask for their input because, you know, their, their experience, they've worked at other clubs and, and um, I ask for their input on what they've done at other clubs. And 
how can we, let's say, mold the two together, my beliefs and and what they've learned before that. And I think that that's, that's important. Um, but uh, eventually, you know, what I want them to do is, is know exactly what we like to do at Ardsley and, and where that's, you know, where the, does that want to go? Um, and if they're not doing it, as you said, feedback uh, to them, um, I can, ex I think explaining why in depth, why I don't like to do it that way and why I do it let's say my way. And I like them to do it my way um, because this is the reasoning behind it. And I think that that's, that's important that it's not just, no, we don't do it that way. Well, let's hear why we don't do it that way or why we do do it that way. This is the reason I like to do this. And it's, and this is the reason I'm doing this. I think exp explaining it to them a lot and, and taking the care to explain it to them gets them again, um, uh, in your in your corner and understanding, and then they have no problem then coming to you for questions that they might might need answer. So feedback to them, and then them giving feedback to you about what what you're telling them and and why they did it differently at another club. And I'm I'm 41 years at Ardsley, but I I can always learn new tricks, and uh, I think I've 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 done that over the years. Is is take what other assistants bring to me, and and maybe work with them. Because if if they came from a Let's say they work for Brendan. I, I want to know everything um, that Brendan would do, so so that I could maybe incorporate some of that into my um, my culture here at the club. Great stuff, Jim. Um, thanks, Sharon. We'll go uh, go to Reed. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I think I mean essentially everybody's kind of expressed amazing ideas here, and and my sort of concepts are kind of bits and pieces of each. I think it all boils down to really a collective effort um, as a group um, to not only serve the membership's best needs, but also serve the best needs of every individual on staff. Um, and just just kind of taking care of one another um, is, is a, as important as anything else. Um, and that's kind of what I try to stress to, to my team as much as possible is, is and, and also show them kind of but through example, not necessarily even through words is it's by putting in positions that are going to be successful. They're going to be successful individually by caring about their futures and, and under, allowing them to understand why they're doing cer certain things and, and how we do certain things um, and how that's going to impact them down the road, as well as impact the membership on a daily basis. Um, and And kind of one of the best lines I think I've I've heard as a leader is from I, I took from Grant Sturgeon over at Arcola is he, he said my my role is to deflect praise and accept blame uh, as, as the leader of the group. So I think the more that we can do that as leaders of leaders of our teams and really kind of make sure that our, our staff's getting getting praise for what they're doing well and and getting praise for for every everything that they deserve praise for. But we're accepting the blame as the leader for the one where the buck stops. And we're, we're able to, um, we're able to take that and, and then provide the feedback when necessary, that's going to allow us to get better and not just kind of crumble under some of those struggles as well. Um, so I think really it's, it's that collective effort. I loved how, how Brendan said earlier, it's, it's we, not me. That's a big thing for me. Um, is really expressing that to the team. I mean, everything is a we thing. Um, we collectively did X, Y, and Z. We collectively didn't do X, Y, Z. Um, and and as a as a leader, what ends up happening happening is when it comes to the membership, it's I failed, but we succeeded um, in trying to differentiate those those things and making sure that that's. Um, that's kind of the through line for everything um, is, is collective success. Um, and then allowing the, uh, allowing the assistants that are all there for a reason to shine in their own, their own individual way. Reed, I'm going to stay with you here a little bit. Um, you mentioned something earlier on that certainly resonated when you're establishing that mentor mentee relationship or someone is joining your team. Um, you have to get it an understanding of where they want to go, um, mm -hmm. personally or professionally. So how do you go about, you know, establishing goals and we'll get specific with, with individuals on your team? Like, what is that process? What does that process look like? I mean, I think it starts personally. Um, I think you need to know sort of what are, 
what the individual's goals are from like, where do they want to be in their life? Not just as a, as a PGA professional is, is, do you have a significant relationship in your life right now? Do you want to have a family? Where, where do you see yourself? Um, I think that's sort of a one to me. Um, and a lot of times it just takes, you have, you, it, it, you have to sort of make them kind of comfortable and understand that you're, you have their best interests in mind um, to get there. Um, and then, and then I try to work into the professional stuff because a lot of times professional goals, goals don't jive with personal goals. Um, and the more important piece for anybody is to be happy as an individual, um, and to really chase what they want to want to chase, because if they may, they may really think they want to do one thing. And I think this goes back to sort of my conversation with Andrew Shuck back in the day is I thought that I wanted to do one thing and pursue another thing when in reality, the better decision for me from a personal standpoint and for really where I wanted to go was, was to take another route. Um, so it's kind of teasing that out of an individual to make sure that their professional goals match up with where they want to go as an individual. I think that's, that's really the core of what you have to establish. And you can, sometimes it takes a little more time. Sometimes it, it doesn't. Um, and, but you can't, it's hard to it's hard to really plan a, a structured attack on from a mentorship standpoint until you get to that point until mm -hmm. until the individual really has a defined goal or a dis defined vision of where they want to end up and where they ultimately think they'll they'll be happy. Lot, lots of good stuff there, Reed. Um, I saw I saw AJ even taking notes. <laughs> so AJ, I'm going to turn it to you. Um, you know, how do you go with your, about your team, right? So how do you establish that um, and and getting a little more granular? Um, with, with your team and, and certainly some, you know, the individuals, um, you know, how do you go about that goal setting process for them, both personally and professionally? I got probably, I think two pages of notes here already. This is great stuff. Uh, let's see. I probably have done it better in the past than I have uh, maybe last year uh, at Sleepy. I, I used to be huge into goal setting and uh, smart goals are incredible and i mean there's all kinds of different strategies on how best to set goals and how to stay accountable to those goals um probably most recently i have simply kind of along with what reed is saying I, I i sit down with the staff and and the sooner you can target something very specific uh what, what exactly do you want to do what part of the region do you want to do that in where's your family where do you want to end up uh then the more strategic and intentional you can be in in uh your career progression. Um, so I, I tend to do three one-on-ones with our staff, one at the beginning, middle, end of the season. Um, it is time consuming. It is an investment. Uh, a lot of these meetings end up being two to three hours, but it's, a, it's kind of a full check-in to see how everyone's doing and, um, and get their full perspective on the entire operation, kind of even beyond their personal and professional goals. But uh, I think a lot of it just simply comes down to caring about your staff. I, I think if you if you don't genuinely care about their staff, about your staff, and, and whether or not they're happy, whether or not they're succeeding professionally, and what's going on in home life, uh, gosh, it feels like people always have. It seems like fifty percent of our staffs always have something going on in the background, mm -hmm. uh, relationships, family, something, and, and taking an interest in them and, and letting them know you care and I think is is probably one of the one of the um I, I feel like that's one area where I I feel like I've done well is is I, I genuinely do care uh, about the staff and, and I know that they know that. Um so I, I think that's probably number one. Perfect. Thanks AJ. Sam, I'm going to turn it over to you a little bit and, and give the audience a little bit of peek behind the curtain at, at Weaver and certainly if you know if they're part of the team. Like, how do you go about the um, the goal setting process? Um, you know, with with the, the individuals on your team. So, I mean, I think there's two pieces of that puzzle. I mean, I I think the goal setting initially um, is also also part of the interview process when I onboard people or I'm in the interview process, I'm really curious as to kind of, you know, where they've been and where they see themselves going. Cause again, I'm a big believer, especially at their level that, you know, what's the next move. Okay. If, 
if you are you looking at a top 100 club because that comes up a lot you know i i want to go to a top 100 and we weren't obviously is not a top 100 club but i feel that you know, if you come to Weeburn, I think you're gonna have a great learning experience. I think you're gonna have an opportunity to do all facets of the operation. You're gonna get a good hands-on um, experience doing them without being overly micromanaged. So, I mean, we've got the team part of our goals and that's, you know, broken down in the typical uh, member services, tournament ops, instructions, juniors. And then individually, you know, it's more of a check-in to kind of, again, to continue on from what the interview process was as to, you know, what they've accomplished, what they haven't accomplished, what we can continue to do to try to help them get to that next spot or that next level. So again, it, I would say it's, as AJ was saying, I don't have a specific three times a year, although I like that. Um, some of the times it's more on the move versus, you know, sitting down in my office. Um, I think a lot of times it may be away from the club, quite honestly, where I'll spend time with uh, assistant professionals, just learning more about what's going on in their lives personally, what's going on professionally. And, and as we all do, we, we consider our um, staff, our, our family. And I think that's an incredible relationship to have not many people in the business world um, get as close to staff members and really impact their lives quite honestly the way we do because we are small families and so uh, always revisiting always checking in kind of finding out um, you know maybe why they're struggling in an interview situation and maybe what we can do to kind of help find that success either through a mock interview or to through seeing maybe another specialist that maybe can help uh, with that with kind of getting over that uh, obstacle, but those are typically kind of the ongoing team, but, you know, personal um, goal setting that we do with our team. Thanks, Sam. Uh, let's go Brendan and then Jim. Brendan, how about you? Uh, not a lot to add here. Everybody's got great thoughts. You know, the big key is uh, you got to show them you care. You got to spend the time with them, you know, for, you know, AJ says you meet three times a year. If you can schedule that now as head professionals and put that time in your book to make sure that you make that time, because if you wait to find the time, you're not going to find it. Something always is going to come up. You put it in your book, you treat it like a lesson and you put yourself in, you're going to go ahead. We do half hour meets every six weeks uh, with team. And again, it requires a lot of time. And if you look at the amount of time you spend, but it allows you by spending that time, that 30 minutes with them allows you to have that time to do all the other things that you're going to do because you know the operation is going to be taken care of. We do a 360 review at the end of the season that uh, staff it has to self-evaluate and put their goals in there. And, and I have them uh, do goals for three years out. So we are always addressing those to find out where they are and, and making sure we do what we can to try to help them through that process. And those goals change. People change, like Reed talked about. I've had a lot of conversations with people, Reed, that want to go in one direction and you try to steer them or they want to go work in a certain area because they have a significant other down there. And I try to remind them, you know, if you leave here and you go down and work in that place, is that going to help you big picture? That significant other is going to want you to be the, the rainmaker of the family down the road and you got to be careful where you're going. And so you, you have those tough conversations with them at times. And sometimes you're crossing the line from a relationship point of view, but you're trying to steer them in the right direction that they're not making a decision that they're going to regret down the road. And if you have some that you regret, I had a young man, I'll tell a story here that he was a kid who, that we, when we hired him, we knew that he had a lot of potential, but he needed a lot of coaching. He was a, I think a sophomore intern at Penn state. And he came to me at the end of his time frame. We set him up some great internships and every place he improved and, at a soft spot, came from a blue collar family. His parents really didn't know about club life or anything like that. And he never really uh, worked in private sector. And he gets out of school and he's got a great job, set him up at a great place that was, you know, not that some of the clubs where he worked, but he got a full time assistance position and he had an opportunity at a, an off store retail store. And it was $5,000 more in health insurance. And I was trying to steer him to say, you got to look at the big picture and where you're going to go in the club environment because you're going to do really well and you're going to, he made so much progress. And he opted for the off store, working in the store, taking that. And he's bounced around in a lot of different places, but just crushed me because he had so much potential and he had come so far and it would have been a great success story. And 
So you're going to get those ones that, you know, as uh, Reed talked about, where you're giving them guidance and trying to help them with their goals. And they change because they're chasing dollars or what have you, not looking at the big picture. And sometimes you you have those difficult conversations. But I love when they come back and thank you for steering them in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And we've had some success stories that we're going to go in one direction and like Reed are uh, in a, a really good place now and where they are and, and uh, to watch. So it's, but, you know, everything that the, this team has said here on the call is all right on, right on the money. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, sharing that, Brent. Go ahead. Hey, Jonathan, if, if I could just add to that real sure. quick, I mean, I think that's a really powerful message. I think that um, many times young professionals are always lured by the opportunity to make a couple more thousand dollars or this or that. And I would, I would certainly reiterate, I know that's a tough thing for people to do these days, but certainly that was part of my career path when I, you know, I had a, a nice opportunity. I was making good money at, at uh, Canobra Country Club. I was doing a lot of instruction and then I had the opportunity to go up and work for Craig Harmon at Oak Hill. And, you know, that was an op- it was a great opportunity as we were leaving in the Ryder Cup, but I made less money. And again, I wasn't making a whole lot of money anyways at Canobra, but I was making decent money. And then, you know, part of my, uh, as I continued on my journey to try to learn more about the instruction side of things, not only from Craig, but to go down and work for Jim McLean. So I went down there and anybody that's worked for, for Jim or uh, heard about those horror stories, you make less than um, possibly imaginable back back in the day. So I'm sure it's still not much more. But so for, for basically four years of my career, I, I went back and made less and less money. But in the end, I had worked for the right individuals at the right spots that those guys would do anything for me today. I could call them up and they'd write me a letter of recommendation or a reference or, you know, help me in any way, shape or form. But again, it's hard to see that when you're a young professional and, you know, you maybe aren't making as much money and and hopefully we're making more money now than, than we were, you know, a lot more than we were. But um to be short-sighted, to take that, you know, just a couple thousand bucks or whatever, as Brendan said, to really kind of lose the path or the trajectory on. And that's obviously the conversations we have to continue to have with our staff as we go through that. Yeah. Thanks team. Uh, Jim, so do you, I think we kind of went through like the goal setting process and have a good idea there, but Brendan and Sam were kind of bringing up um, possibly some pain points that come along the way with, you know, taking a vested interest and someone else, right? And and wishing for their success um, and certainly try to steer them to the path um, that they um, that they they said that they were interested in pursuing. Now, with that said, Jim, I'm just curious, right? You've had, a, um, you know, are there any mistakes um, that you feel that you've made along the way of being a mentor for someone else? Yeah, I think even talking about um, back when I was working for Russ, he was, he was of the mindset that you'd work as an assistant pro at a club for three years, and then you'd hopefully get your head pro job or a much higher level top 100 assistance job. And um, so I kind of stuck with that pattern when I got my head pro job. So whenever I had um, a golf professional come work for me, I, I told him up front, you know, you're going to work for me, you know, first year, you're going to be more of, of learning the operation teaching junior clinics, you're going to move up into teaching full-time the next year and the following year, you're going to kind of, you're going to be doing everything that a head golf professional would be doing, including, you know, running the operation. And when you leave here after three years, you're going to be ready for your head pro job. And that's kind of how I stuck with it until probably uh, 2011 or 12. And that, at that time, what I did was, at that time, what I did was, um, I kept a person on longer and uh, he was a really good assistant. He went to the finals and he was, he was with me for eight years, but he went to the finals of probably 10 job interviews um, over the course of those eight years or, or maybe, maybe six of the years. And he went to uh, head pro interviews and he all finally got his own job after eight years with me. Probably when I look back at it, it would have been better for him to move up to another position, a higher up assistance position, top 100, et cetera, and, um, and, and gotten a job maybe a little bit quicker. I could have helped him a little bit more by letting him go, if you know what I mean. And I don't know how uh, all of the other people on the panel, um, which I respect so much, 
how they do that. If nowadays, sometimes you say, if you get a great assistant, you want to keep them. But at the same time, are you doing him a disservice by keeping him um, without him maybe broadening his horizons and either going to a better assistance job or higher up a uh, level, which I guess, you know, some of these guys uh, on the panel will not, you know, have a higher assistance position um, than where they're at. Uh, but like for Ardsley, you could go to a, let's say a Wingfoot or you could go work for Sam Wiley up at uh, Weburn. So, you know, should I have let him go? That was my mistake by maybe not letting him go earlier and move on to that next assistance position just because he didn't get his head pro, his pro, head pro position. Yeah, Jim, thanks for sharing. Um, Sam, I'm going to go to you for this one as well. Um, you know, again, maybe it's a two part question, like, what, what is mentoring someone else? What has it taught you? And then, you know, what are some of the pitfalls that or, or mistakes that you've made from, you know, your, your time investing with others? I mean, first of all, I love mentoring. I think it's in my DNA. It's been the way I've been since I was a high school golf player, a college golf player um, early, you know, in, in my career. Actually, I worked outside of golf before I got into golf. I've always loved mentoring. Um, I would certainly say I've made mistakes for sure. Um, you know, I, whether it be kind of to Jim's comment, I think there are times, um, you know, certainly where I've cut the cord, so to speak with an assistant professional to really make them make a decision saying, this is your final year. You've got to make the move. I think that, um, you know, I think that is a big decision to make. I think it's sometimes easy. I I've spoken to, some of my current staff, quite honestly, about that, because, you know, when I was starting as a, as a golf professional, when I worked for at Oak Hill, you know, it was basically three years and out. That was kind of the old school program. And, and I no longer believe that. I think the nature of our jobs, the nature of our clubs, the nature of our membership, it is not that type of environment anymore. The, the learning curve is greater. Uh, it's important for the members to create those relationships with staff. But, you know, again, at the same time, how long can somebody stay with you before you actually injure them? And I mean, I, I have this discussion ongoing because that's the last thing. It is, it is hard um, for some people to kind of get over the, get over the, the hill and, and get their job. And, you know, what is the right thing for them to do, um, you know, to get there? And, and again, back to my earlier comment, I think more and more it's harder. You know, our jobs are good. People have a really nice lifestyle. We're very flexible in our kind of um, how we schedule staff, how we give uh, freedom of uh, time to take off, whether it be for family, for whatever you need. You know, we're very user friendly in that fashion. But um, again, at, at what point, you know, are they willing to, to take less to go somewhere to go work for Brendan at the country club or to go um, to another, again, top 100 or top 20 club or working for the right individual to help them kind of get over the top. Um, so that's something that I actually continually talk to my, you know, there's a couple of members of my current staff that I talk to about that a lot. You know, I don't want to injure you. You're obviously well loved here, but that's, that's a fine line. And I think the other kind of the mistake, and I don't know if it's truly a mistake because, um, maybe we've all had this happen, but I've had several of my assistants, you know, some, some people take any job. They want to become a head professional, maybe because they have um, a challenge. Maybe they're not great players. Maybe there's a missing ingredient in making them really a great professional, but I've had it on a couple occasion and, you know, I've tried to speak up. I try to give them as much leash as they can. And obviously it's their decision per personally and professionally, uh, but where, the, where they've taken bad jobs and they've, you know, a, a couple have, um, you know, left the job, come back and be assistant professionals because it wasn't the right situation. But that's that's a that's something that's always at play and is always a little bit of a dilemma as a, you know, a friend and as a leader and as a mentor. You know, you, you can only say so much because it's ultimately their decision. So those are the, the, the two challenges that I've kind of and mistakes maybe I've made along the way. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, going to go to Brendan, and then going to go to uh, you know a question that are put in the chat here. Uh, Brendan, how about you? Um, 
from from your perspective, like what what is mentoring taught you, and and maybe you know looking introspective about it, like what are some mistakes that you know or things that you maybe you would have done differently? Uh, I think you kind of alluded to an example before, but you know, is there anything else there? Yeah, you know, I so, saw uh, just to Jim's comment. You know, I think everybody's different, Jim, based on where they are. And I kind of started that at TCC and the members were a little bit anxious because people come in for two or three years and they would move. And, uh, and then we've started to hire, you know, kind of, I call it the, the ground level approach. Most of our hires are interns and then we work our way up uh, through the system. And so we have people here for up to nine or 10 years because they're starting at 18 where they're coming back for multiple internships. And then we hire them as an assistant. We kind of use it as a farm system and, you know, it's really neat when you can say that every one of your top senior assistants started here as an intern. So uh, the members have a little bit more of a comfort level, a little bit more familiarity. So I just think if people are growing each year and they're still being challenged, and that's something we talk about in our evals, do you still feel like you're being challenged is enough? We try to go ahead and give more responsibility each year as well. So that has been a, um, a helpful thing to know when it's time to cut the cord. Uh, for folks, if they feel like they're not progressing, so with that, but we've all made mistakes. You now you, I, I use that one example, and there's times where you're trying to uh, encourage somebody to maybe apply for this job or that job, and I'll use another example where it was fortunate as a young man who was on our team that was, you know, probably third or fourth in line, and there was a really good opportunity that came open that uh, in his eyes it was a really good opportunity. In my eyes, it was not what I thought he was capable of. And had to have a really tough conversation with him because he was going to make a lot more money than he was making with us and a chance to apply for a job. And I said, hey, I'm going to support you on this. And he went through the process. But I just said, you're a lot better than this. And you can get better jobs in this. And I worry about this club that they have struggled financially over the years. And do you want to be in, in that situation? And you have to have those tough conversations because, as you said, they want to be head professionals. But if the club's not a sound club. Uh, are they going to be able to move from there in three to five years? And that's the thing. And so he eventually was offered the job and he turned it down and he came back to me and you know, he appreciated the fact that I was very candid with him and honest with him because it let him to think about it. You know, as he went through the process, he's still here as an assistant today. Uh, so mm -hmm. he's in it for the long haul, but to have that conversation where he could have doubled what he was making to go work at this club, but I expressed, you know, what his skill set was and where he is. And so He's in it for the long haul now, and he's going to get himself a great job. He'll be able to apply, start applying for jobs this uh, this fall, and he'll be ready to go. So you, you have situations that each one's different, and I just don't think you can have a cookie cutter program. Everybody uh, a little different as you go, but it's you have to have those tough conversations at times. Mm -hmm. And yeah, again, been plenty of times where you know, when people are applying for jobs and maybe you didn't get the right people to write letters for them, or you didn't write enough letters because the previous job they applied for, they got too many letters or you made phone calls or the wrong person called on their behalf and you don't know the lay of the land of that club. And so there are a lot of uh, little things that go. And, and I always tell people, I said, you can't change every time you go to a job because they gave you feedback on X and you go ahead and change that because that club maybe wanted the next club you're going to may have wanted what they gave you a feedback on. So every club is a little bit different. You have to treat each one separately and, and kind of navigate that way. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Brennan. Um, I want to dive into, and I'm going to open this up for anyone uh, or certainly all that want to answer this. You know, Eric Steindel asked a question in the chat. You know, how important do you think it is to encourage your staff members to consider opportunities outside of their geographic area? I can, uh, I'll jump in on that. I mean, I, I think working for Bob, he made that, abundantly clear that if you limit yourself geographically that you're limiting your opportunities um i mean i'm i'm someone that grew up in denver colorado um so i i my whole family's still out there i uh, went to school down in florida um but i never i never once really thought about where i was going to end up um i kind of basically let it left it open to whatever the best opportunity that uh, came my way is, I mean, uh, leaving, leaving Seminole in 2019, I took a job that, um, uh, that I, that was a, a lot of people probably thought was questionable for me to take, but, um, I think it, I, I felt it was the right decision. I felt I needed to do it. Um, and that was kind of what opened the door in the Met section for me. And I, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't taken that job. So, um, I think if, I think it really is important to make sure that, 
as like our assistants are open-minded to the best opportunity and keeping the big picture in mind. I think what that was mentioned earlier, I think that's the more important piece is where do you want to go? Where do you want to end up? Where does this opportunity fit into that big picture? And it's not always a perfect science. I mean, sometimes guys are going to take, take an opportunity that on paper is a great opportunity and doesn't work out. And sometimes they're going to take an opportunity that maybe has is kind of a high volatility or high risk opportunity and it works out perfectly. So we never know what it's, what it, it's going to happen. I think, I think the key is making sure that you stay as open as possible to every opportunity that comes your way and, and process that. And it goes back to where do you see yourself? Where do you want to end up? And if, and if you pigeonhole yourself into an area, you pigeon your whole, you pigeonhole yourself into a specific job, you're probably going to limit your opportunities. Um, and you have to be real, more realistic with what you want. And you also may have to pursue more jobs that you ne wouldn't necessarily meet your criteria to get to where you want to go, um, at least in the short term. So, um, my, I mean, to summarize back, if, if someone's open to it and being open minded to where they end up, I think that's extremely important to the amount of opportunities that an individual gets. Um, but that's not a, it's not a deal killer. It's just sometimes you probably have to work harder and be better to get to where you want to go. If you're, if you're dead set on ending up in a certain place or a certain job. Thanks Reed. Any, anyone else want to share a perspective on that? Like considering opportunities outside the geographic area? Yeah, I mean, I, I could speak to it. I mean, I, I, I'm all for it. I certainly moved around the country a lot. But again, it's all obviously very personal. Um, again, if, if they are married or if they by chance have a family, there's a lot of different pieces of that equation that are going to dictate, you know, you know, where they want to go or where their wife may be from. You know, I was fortunate. I kind of navigated all that before I was engaged or even got married. But Again, I think you really have to be able to sell your story. They first, they have to want to go there. They have to want to go to that region of the country, or other, otherwise, they're not going to be able to interview well and be able to sell their story. Because I think a lot of clubs look at kind of you know why are you here? You know, it's uh, you've been raised on the East Coast. Now you want to come to Oklahoma. I don't know if that's an easy sell to uh, or to Texas. But if you have a story to tell that kind of leads that in that direction, or maybe they're from the West coast, or maybe they went to school in the you know, Midwest and, and whatever. I think that just helps it. But I certainly think that everybody's going to be what inclined one way or the other. They're either going to want to be more local and, and local is not, I think locals, it's a little too uh, unrealistic to say, I, I want to stay in the Met section. Or I want to be in the Met section, but if you know, my region is the East coast or the Northeast or, you know, that, you know, whatever that may be, or I'm from Pittsburgh, you know, I'll go to Ohio, I'll go to Western Pennsylvania. Th those, those are easy stories to tell. And again, I think they have, um, I think that's important for the individual to be happy wherever they're going to be, because that's, that's going to help make it a long-term decision. Love it. Great. Um, probably same question for the panel here. AJ, I'm going to start with you. Um, yeah, we certainly talked a little bit about like you know, the, the pitfalls, like some of the mistakes that, that we can make and, and mentoring and, and learning from that experience. But on the other side, frankly, mentoring someone else is incredibly rewarding, right? Um, possibly one of the most rewarding things that you can we can do in our profession um, and, and having success uh, in, in doing so. So question for AJ, and then I'll turn it around to the group as well is, you know, um, you know, what are you most proud of? Um, you know, and mentoring and, and your, you know, and your personal mentoring journey of others? Mm. Good question. Let's see. Uh, uh, I liked your prelude to that. I've actually kind of <laughs> thought in the past that, that, well, but one of the, what's one of the sayings that there's no greater joy in life than, than helping somebody else. Uh, so I've, I've even thought that sometimes am I selfish in putting so much energy in into the staff because I feel like I benefit so much from it. I, I get such a, uh, a, a great feeling of joy to, to see somebody else um, go on and achieve their, their professional dreams. And uh, what am I most proud of? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I hopefully you ask me in the next five or 10 years, I, I, I feel like I've got a, a couple of good stories now, but uh, 
just it's really fun to try to build a program where we're very intentional in our in our goal setting and in our development and uh and chasing different dreams and um so really i i'm i'm proud to be at sleepy hollow in this position and be in an opportunity to to try to create a culture to try try to create a a program um similar to to Brennan Walsh and, and, and everything that he taught me and, and just trying to help other people. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's been, it's been a whole lot of fun and, and, and that's really, it's just kind of all about helping people. And sometimes, yeah, it's, I, I've joked that it's, it's for selfish reasons, but uh, I mean, I, I come from a big family and my older brothers were great mentors to me. And uh, at times, probably not always. And, and then my younger brother kind of watching him succeed and, in different roles throughout his life. I mean, that was just such a, an amazing feeling to, to see my younger brother go on and, and achieve success. And, and then again, to be exposed to uh, the Brendan Walsh's of the world and the Bob Ford's and to see the amount of, of positive influence that they have had in, in other people's lives has just been uh, the ultimate inspiration. Thanks, AJ. Brendan, I'm going to go to you, but you can't say AJ. All right. So what, what do you, uh, in your, you know, in your mentorship journey, like not that you have to pinpoint one specific thing and obviously it's incredibly rewarding, but you know, what, what are you, what are you incredibly proud of? Oh, thank you. Thanks AJ for your kind words, you know, uh, just helping young men and women progress, uh, you know, when you start them at 18 years of age and watch, and, you know, I use uh, some examples of folks that had a very difficult time of shaking hands with somebody and to see them now thriving at a top 100 club and, and they get married and they buy a house and, and that you were part of that journey with them and, and they're on their way and they have great careers. And that's what I'm most proud of. And obviously the club opens up so many doors and, you know, working at an incredible place like this, when you send your resume, and I never take that for granted, you send your resume from TCC, you're probably going to get a look and, but they make sure that they're prepared and to watch them go through the process when they first start to interview and we put them through a training program for interviewing. You know, you have to make sure that they're ready, but to see once they uh, make progress over a three to four week period and putting them on camera and, and now they're almost ready to go and then they get that interview and then they get called for a second interview. And those are the things that by giving them the time that they're able to take that knowledge and incorporate it into their own ideas and to, to go ahead and see where they are. And uh, one of the, the gents on the call is Joe Connerton. He's an incredible success story and something I'm so proud of. And when Joe started with us and at 21 years of age and see where he is today, he had a great career at Hartford Golf Club. And he's now at the Round Hill Club. And, you know, it's, um, you know, he's exceeded all expectations of where his life was when he was a young man to see where he is today. But I give him all the credit. We steered him in the right direction, but he's taken that direction and has just made an incredible life for himself with his wife, Laura, and their two daughters and, and where he is today at Round Hill. It's, uh, you know, there's the success stories, the CAJ success stories, every one of them I'm so proud of and I'm so blessed. Uh, and Reed worked in that same type of environment and AJ did with Bob and, you know, it's, and you have a family now and we have a an unbelievable alumni group that they can all learn from one another. And they're the kind of things that you're proud of as well. We do a little alumni dinner at the PGA show every year. And, you know, folks uh, come from different eras and they get a chance to meet the new folks coming and you get anywhere from 40 to 70 people there. And it's, it's it makes you proud that you've been part of all that you know, as you, they go through their careers. You're on mute there. My apologies. Thanks That's because I was finished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my apologies. Thanks for sharing, Brennan. Sam, how about you? Sure. I got to follow Brendan and his 40 to 70 at the alumni dinner. I don't necessarily <laughs> kind of roll like that, but that's that's really impressive stuff. Yeah. I mean, as you say, it's it's the joy, the reward of, you know, watching all these young men and women kind of go through kind of their life and um i enjoy we probably text daily with with my former assistants that are not only in golf but outside of golf and and watching you know some of you know, again these the, that are out of out of golf that have been members at several clubs now and have had achieved great success kind of in their in their world and then obviously the people that 
have stayed within golf and are, are very successful in their own right um, at their spots. I certainly, you know, when I get to the end of my uh, runway and I look back and I stand and I, I, I speak to the membership or whatever, it won't be about the, you know, the cart barn or the golf performance center that I built at the club or, or whatever. It's always going to be about the people, the family and everybody that's helped me um, really uh, represent golf and the golf experience at Weburn Country Club. So those type of joys, that type of um, love is what I'm so proud of. And, uh, you know, I hope to continue to do that um, for many years, but it's been uh, a lot of fun and hope to continue, like I said. Thanks, Sam. Reed, same question. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously very sort of early in my head professional mentorship career, but um, just seeing people kind of get to have, have success and even on a small scale level. I, I mean, I, I remember working with Brendan, one of your guys, Nick Hollowell that at Oakmont and, and having a lot of conversations with him, um, just in casual of kind of where you want to go, what do you want to do? How do you want to get there? And to see what he's done for, for you up at, at the country club is something that I'm, I'm very proud of and kind of those relationships that I feel like I've. I've had a had a part of or at least kind of seen seen them take some of our conversations and and put them into into practice um has has been really really rewarding and kind of like like Sam said and AJ said it's something that has kind of a become a passion that is has sort of developed for me um and and now it's trying to build that program like Brendan was talking about and AJ was talking about and and kind of trying to develop a pipeline and and kind of build from the ground up and and obviously and you know I'm only in my entering my third year of of doing this here at piping but um kind of being able to sort of set the groundwork and and start to start to move people up and move people on is the ultimate goal and um something that it, that I sort of can kind of envision in in working what in that in that way to get to get to that alumni base and to get to get get to seeing guys be successful in the industry and and if they're if it's not in the industry just being successful as individuals is really ultimately what matters more to me reed thanks for sharing obviously jim i have to go to you on this one as well um you know the, the mentorship journey obviously um never stops right um some are you know in the beginning and, and some are um, a little bit longer right like brendan and sam and jim as you as well like looking back and reflecting, you know, what are some things that you're, you know, you are most proud of? Well, I'm definitely most proud of when I see the guys who worked for me and gone through the program that we have at Ardsley and, and gotten their own head pro jobs and still at their jobs, the, the Greg Bryans and the Mike Shanks and um, Jim Wall, um, Pete Stefanczyk and Craig Thomas. So th those are the guys who worked for me over the years and, uh, did such a good job working for me and went on and become very successful head golf professionals. And, uh, and, uh, and Nick Iacono is now down at um, Marion uh, teaching uh, and, and doing a great job down there. Um, so those, those things that, you know, you help them through it. Uh, they take certain things from uh, let's say our program here at Arsley and, and we, we, they take it to another level and they do it their way. But at the same time, during that time, it's uh, it's been you know a fantastic journey for them, uh, and then now they're ending up very successful golf professionals. And I think as PGA members, um, you know, it's it's our duty to mentor people, to to be to be the mentors of everybody that works for you, and hopefully they become better uh, at the positions that they're going to become, and 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 have a good life. Um, and their, and have a good life for their families. And I think that that's why that that's what gets me, you know, proud uh, of of doing the things I've done over the last 40 years. And and um, being able to do it here at one club, I think, was really special because uh, uh, the members here at Ardsley are really fantastic. And, you know, it makes it a little bit easier to mentor people when they know that they're working at a club here. Um, that that's totally behind the golf professional staff. And, and, and that's been big, too. Thanks, Jim. I'm, I'm going to stay on you for a second here, as I know we're we're approaching the the end, right? And, and time certainly flew. We, you know, for me, the the content is tremendous, um, and a lot of things learned that I'm 
honestly going to go back and rewatch this just to to take careful notes here. So, um, you know, with that said, I just want to go around to everyone. Um, certainly, thank you for your time. But just you know, any closing comments, Jim? I'll start with you and 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 go to Reed, AJ, and Sam, and then Brendan. Any any closing comments? Well, I think kind of what I just said uh, at the end was about um, what we as head golf professionals or director of golfs. Um, it's our duty, um, you know, as as being members of the PGA of America to get behind mentorship and and making sure we do the the best the best that we can to to make our assistants better to learn to learn the business to learn the game um, and therefore when they're done after whether it be continuing on as uh, an assistant at um, at your club if they become as as Brendan said a longer time assistant or a uh, for the for the long haul, um, that's fine. I I agree. Um, probably some with me, it, it would have been less time and and trying to get them to move up and become better at their position. Um, but as Brendan said, nowadays you know we're looking at um, you know better paying assistance jobs at different clubs, and therefore you can mentor your people to stay at your position and at your job. But at the same time, they could become good teachers. Um, of course, you're paying a better salary and and they can at least stay there as long as they want to and then move on to a, a greater position if they have that opportunity. Thanks for sharing, Jim. Reed. Yeah, so um, I think, as Jim said, I mean, as as PGA professionals, I mean, we we are the custodians of sort of the golf business and the custodians of, of our clubs. And, um, I think I, I would, I would say that it's, it's our jobs to be constant adv advocates for sort of the PGA professionals in our profession, um, and, and mentorship and, um, all this starts even before we get an assistant or we get an intern. Um, and it's important to be, be great represent representatives of, the PGA professional in our, in our communities and um, kind of growing youth caddy programs and in, in getting kids involved in the game and, and, and developing these pipelines, even before we, they even touch a PGM school, um, getting more candidates to go to PGM schools and, and kind of trying to develop more and more potential PGA pros down the line and trying to get more and more good people in the business is, is so important. Um, so I encourage everybody on this call at whatever level you are to, kind of be that advocate in, in our communities and at our clubs and and do what you can to get um, your junior golfers involved um, and understand kind of sort of what we all do and 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 that we care about them um, and their development in golf and and also that look that there's pathways to get involved in and and do what we we do and you can you can make a life and make a career around golf um, if if that's what you love doing so um, I think that's something that we all can do, especially people that are struggling to find, um, find good help or, and that's what we can do to help each other in growing the talent pool as well. So the more good people that we can get in the game and the more good people that we can get to want to become PGA professionals, the more mentorship opportunities we're going to have. Um, and that's how we're going to sort of leave, leave the game and leave our clubs in a better place than we, we found them. And, um, I think that's ultimately what everybody everybody here on this call certainly is is looking for yeah well said thank you reed we'll go uh aj and then sam and then brendan yeah amen reed jim well said love it yeah I, I guess my one action item would be to challenge everybody on this call if you're a, in a position of leadership to schedule some one-on-ones with with your staff sit down with them ask them check in how they're doing what what are their goals professionally and personally, asking for their opinions, get them comfortable making decisions, uh, get them kind of bought into uh, your vision as the operation. Um, I'm going to steal something from Brendan. Brendan always says to us, for, for us to, uh, the head professionals, to request uh, performance appraisals from our golf committees and, and our board members and our general managers. And so if you're an assistant on this call and and you you aren't getting that kind of feedback, then to reach out to your head professional and to to say, hey, I want to sit down, I want to talk about the year, I want to uh, I want to share some of my goals. And if you have to take the initiative, then then take the initiative. Um, 
even from a recruiting aspect, I feel like uh, obviously so many of these PGM programs have dwindling numbers and enrollments and recruiting, I feel like is more difficult now than certainly any time in, in my career in golf. And if, if you aren't spending that time with your assistants, then you're just, I feel like we're, we're just handcuffing ourselves if, if we're not taking that extra time to mentor our staffs. Amen to that, AJ. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Sam, and then we'll go to Brandon. Uh, yeah, I just, I think we live in an amazing time. I think the ability um, to share information, you know, when Jim and Brendan and myself were starting and trying to learn the business, really the only way you learned it is from the people that you work for. And there wasn't kind of this free sharing of information. There obviously was no internet. Um, so in today's world to have this platform of zoom for everybody to kind of maybe be in Florida or be at their clubs to listen in this, to be recorded and be able to watch later or whether it be YouTube and instruction, the only way, again, you used to learn in the secrets of Bob forward or go work for Bob or go work for Brendan or go, uh, work for Craig Harmon. Those were in learning even uh instructional styles it's just it was the only way unless you did site visits it was the rare opportunity um for young professionals and i like to do this and i still continue to do this is to go call somebody and go sit down with them and go learn kind of maybe how they do their run their business or how they handle their operation and all i would do is encourage everybody out there as if you know if there's anything that we can do to help you please reach out i prefer in-person visits if you're local, um, schedule a time, I'd be happy to help because again, there's no greater joy than not only sharing it with our staffs that work for us or worked for us in the past, but for other golf professionals out there. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. All right, Brendan. All wonderful impact. A few things to add to that is just as a mentor, I think it's very important to be consistent uh, day in and day out and you know, you think about uh, we get the ups and downs of the day. You get feedback that sometimes can send you your blood pressure up a little bit. And, and uh, but if you can just take a deep breath because you're leading by example and being the mentor, they're going to watch how you react to that. And if you can go ahead and be that duck on the pond, just kind of cruising, you may be swimming underneath and they can't see you, but uh, never let them see you churning. Let them see you be. And there's nobody better than that than Bob Ford Reed, you know, the way he handled that. And it's uh, you always can learn. And the second thing is just think about your lives. 95% of all of our lives are pretty darn good. And some of us, maybe 98, 99% of our lives are really good. And then 1% is not so great or 5% is not so great. But as people, sometimes we find ourselves spending 95% of our time in that 5% negative lane. And if you can just you know, help your team as well. When something goes wrong that, hey, let's get past it. Let's move on. Let's look at all the incredible things that we have each and every day versus trying to stay in that negative lane and beating yourself up for the things that didn't go well. And it's, again, very few, but you look at your entire lives, whether it's at the club or away from the club or with your team and realize how blessed we all are and how fortunate we are uh, to have all the great things and think what this great game of golf allows us to do and the people that we meet and the things that we get a chance to experience. It's incredible. There are so many people who would love to be there. And I, I heard Jim Remy talk about this, past president of the uh, PGA of America, talk about you, know, you as the PGA professional, when you go to the grocery store, they're going to say, hey, that's our professional over there. They're not going to say that about the accountant, the lawyer, the doctor over there. They're going to say that about your celebrity uh, and is where you are and try to make sure that you're presenting yourself in a manner that you are realizing that people look up to you that way. And But be consistent and realize how uh, fortunate you are and stay in the grateful lane and not in the negative lane and spend most of your time in that negative lane. You know, so if, try to catch yourself when you start complaining about things uh, to get yourself out of that and think about all the things that you're grateful for. And I think it, it's it makes our jobs to be a lot easier if you can remember that each and every day. But consistency to your team as a mentor is huge. If you're inconsistent and you're having ups and down days, uh, you're not going to get the most out of your team. Mm -hmm. They're relying on you. And when you go to work every day, there's a lot of people counting on you. And you need to make sure that you're consistent, that you can uh, take care of all the folks that are counting on you. As you go. But this has been an honor. It's a real treat to uh, be part of this. Thank you all very much. And Jonathan, thank you for leading the way. And Jim Bender, uh, again, uh, thanks for 
being such a great mentor and role model throughout the years. So it's been great to see you're still at it, man. I don't know how you're doing it, but I'm proud of you. I'm not going to make it 40 something years. I can tell you that. So congrats to you. <laughs> thanks, Brendan. Well, th thanks everyone. Reed, Jim, AJ, Sam, Brendan, really powerful stuff today. A um, lot of lessons learned and sincere appreciation for your time and willingness to, to, to take part um, and try to share some of the wisdom and some of the lessons that you learned along the way with, you know, our fellow professionals. It's, it's amazing. Um, um, so again, thank you. Thank you for everyone that was on the call for your attention, your presence uh, during the call today. Um, and then the next winter education series event is going to be on March 20th. Uh, it's in person at Century. Uh, it, that entails what is in your future. So looking forward to seeing a lot of you there. Um, but everyone, thank you so much. Um, best of luck with the the, the, the upcoming season. And uh, again, open door, as Sam mentioned, anyone that, that needs some advice or help, you know, we're, we're all here for each other. So thank you all very much. Awesome. Thank you all. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.